We are a group of friends bound by our appreciation for liberty and good podcasting. Free-minded thinkers from all walks of life, our values come together with one accord to discuss the common culture and news of the day, along with whatever random crap is going on in our lives. Welcome to the Union of the Unknowns. Hey, how's everyone doing today? Um, Union of the Unknowns here. Uh, we promised it on the last uh, Not Your Mama's News. We have a follow-up to the FTX story because there's just so much going on here and so many questions that we have to ask. Um, joining us tonight is our great friend, Ashley. Hello. We have a great friend of the show, Stuart. Hello. And, and we have what I'm going to call our crypto expert friend of the show, <laughs> Daniel. Oh, no, don't say that. I'm not an expert. <laughs> I just uh, spend way too much time reading about it. <laughs> but thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I, we appreciate you coming on. Um, so, and I mean, there's there's just really so much here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So, you know, we'll try and keep it down to, you know, 30, 60 minutes, you know, just whatever you got time for. Um, but let me just go ahead and ask you, can you explain just the, you know, a quick brief summary of what's going on with FTX? And can you explain it to me like I'm driving around with by myself in a car with a mask on in 2022? Oh, gosh, I will try. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it's a there's a lot to it. So you could literally talk for hours about it. But I'll try to give a quick summary. Let me so um, there's a, co a company called FTX started by this guy, Sam Bankman Fried, and it kind of came out of nowhere in 2019. Ironically, the same they launched the same month Joe Biden announced his uh, he was running for president. And uh, he had a company before that called Alamada Research. There was a bunch of these kids that had left, not kids, they were young adults that had left a uh, Wall Street trading firm. They're like low level traders there and some of them interns and stuff and started this trading firm, Alameda Research. And they ended up making, uh, and to be honest, nobody really knows where their money came from. I mean, they say they made it, you know, with, with Alameda trading as a trading and market making firm. But to be honest, people were asking this question a few months ago too. Like, where did where did Sam Bankman Free get his money from to start all this? Is I mean, their family's upper middle class, or maybe like mild millionaires or something like that. But they're not they're not dealing in billions of dollars, you know. So that was always a big question. But in uh, FTX over the last three years has gained to be the fourth largest exchange, doing tens of billions of dollars in volume every single day, and they had their parent uh, sister company Alameda Research which was a trading firm and market maker a market maker is someone who provides liquidity for an exchange or a broker just basically to make sure that there's not huge gaps in the price when people go to try to buy some you know you don't want to see the price of bitcoin at 30,000 and you click buy and you buy it for 32,000 you know so these people they uh to get preferential tra trading treatment there but they provide the liquidity and make money off the spreads. So anyways, those two firms are supposed to be separated. And in a regulated environment, they are. A market maker and a broker and exchange can't be the same entity. And they're not supposed to be that closely related or anything. And everybody knew there were some ties between these people. But nobody knew the... Ex no one was guessing. Or I'm sure that there were some people saying this, but most people did not assume they were doing the blatant fraud of taking user funds from FTX customer deposits and sending them to uh, Alameda to do the craziest speculative DeFi, like most risky types of trades you could ever imagine and invest in like the most risky projects. And uh, they took out loans. They So they released their own uh, platform token. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Uh, exchange, they come out with these tokens. I consider 99% of them to be like scams. I think Binance was the first one to do it with BNB token. And their uh, BNB chain, they have their own Ethereum fork that acts like Ethereum, but it's centralized, way more centralized. So, but basically they give print these coins and they give you like, if you hold them, you get, you get cheaper fees on the exchange and stuff like that. Or if you hold them, the yeah, and on some of them, like KuCoins, if you hold KuCoins uh, coin every month, you they distribute a portion of the fees to all the users and stuff like that, which it sounds nice and whatever. And I guess it could be all on the up and up and not a scam. But what these people do is they 
release this token on their exchange. They keep a huge amount of the supply. They manipulate the price themselves, buy and sell, wash trading, just buy and sell between themselves to make it look like it has more volume than it does, drives the price up like crazy. Then they look at, then they show their books and say, hey, we have so much of this coin and each one's worth $20. So we have this much money, but in reality, they don't have that much money because they can't sell it all. And they were manipulating the price themselves. So FTT had their, or FTX had their own token called FTT. <clears throat> and Binance was one of the earliest investors in FTX and held a lot of the FTT. And a couple weeks ago, there was a leak of a balance sheet from FTX showing way less uh, funds than they were had in liabilities, you know? So at first, nothing really happened with that, but Binance CEO CZ came out and said they were exiting their FTT positions and going to sell uh, all of it, but they were going to sell it over months in a way that won't affect the market, which is kind of BS because if you're trying to get, exit a position without affecting the market, you don't go tweeting about it, you know? He, didn't, he did the exact opposite of what he should do. He really, it really seems like he was trying to put a nail in the coffin of FTX. So uh, another uh, Republic just, about it. Yeah. Uh, anecdote from because you guys were talking about Kim.com earlier. I saw him tweeting that he knew uh, that he was talking to people that was basically saying that it was either Binance or FTX that was going to go down, that they're both insolvent and that one of them needed to go down to get the volume, get all that people trading on there over to the to like take more of the market share basically because they're both insolvent and they're both going at each other's throats like under the table and stuff like that with uh trading manipulation and stuff like i don't know if that's true that's just what kim.com said but i thought that was interesting that maybe there was something like that at work where one of them was going to go down or the other and binance just uh took the opportunity to take down ftx that's one of the many hypotheses. But anyway, so they once that happened, people started shorting the coin like crazy. Everybody selling it and shorting it. It dumped from twenty-two dollars or twenty-five or something like that, all the way down to like a dollar to like a dollar twenty-five right now or something like that. And a run in the bank ensued on FTX. People started withdrawing their money, only to find out it all wasn't there. At first, he was saying everything's fine, and. Uh, withdrawals are working the first day he was saying that by the second day he says withdrawals are just being slowed down because we're getting too many of them by the third day they he uh declared insolvency but said ftx us which was supposed to be their regulated arm was not going to be affected so withdrawals kept working on there for a few days then ftx us stopped withdrawals and they all declared bankruptcy and since then uh the crazy news has came out and leaks from within the office just showing the most blatant lack of risk management. Just like, I don't even know. I, I'm baffled at how risky they were with all their trades as a retail trader myself, you know, like they are way more like I should be taking, I should be more way riskier with my small balances than a huge firm is dealing with billions and billions of dollars. And they were just investing in shit coins. Uh, from what I understand, they did not own one Bitcoin. Hmm. Their entire balances were in FTT and Solana and these other shit coins. They did have some Ethereum and stuff, but it is just baffling the way they did it. And then the rumors about rampant drug use, which they found tweets from Alameda Research's uh, CEO. I don't remember her last name, the Caroline girl. I'm sure you guys have all seen her. Oh, where yeah. She's talking about <laughs> using amphetamines. And, and it's just... Recently... Oh, Recently, I've been seeing um, different uh, media companies saying she's the new, like, alt-right, like, chick that's, you know, coming. To, it's, it just Are blows you my mind. Yes, sir. Yeah. She's been referred to as the, alt, like, an alt-right darling. And it's like, what the fuck are you, sorry, what are you talking about? Like, that. She yeah, that's, that's the opposite of everything we know. Completely opposite. Um, but also, I wanted to just ask you, so basically, it seems like a couple of things that jump out at me here. First of all, the timing of this is very strange. Obviously, it was right after the midterm elections, right around that time that it started. Then it on the election thing, night. Okay. Then the other thing is, so the Binance CEO... <clears throat> was the first person of all the people that are closely watching the crypto space to notice something be off with FTX? 
No, they were definitely not the first big person. If you go follow the Twitter account, like uh, Bitfinex, they're like like the exchange Bitfinex. It's one of the oldest exchanges. It's the same company as Tether. They lied about being the same company for years, but then finally admitted that Tether and Bitfinex. Anyways, he's been exposing like Bitfinex and Tether for years. And his Twitter handle is Bitfinex, like a D at the end, possibly D or something. Yeah, and he's been, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, so people have been in this space, have been alerting, like something is not right here. Yes. Now, okay. most of them, though, were not crypto advocates. Like Bitfinex is not a crypto. Ad. He's an ad, he's like almost anti-crypto. And gotcha. then the guys at Crypto Critics Corner, I wouldn't call them anti-crypto, but I actually listen. They're one of my favorite podcasts, actually. They're called Crypto Critics Corner. Okay. And they I mean, if you're really into crypto and actually investing in it, there's something you should probably listen. I mean, you need to listen to what the, you know, other side's saying and stuff like that. You can't let yourself get caught up in a cult mentality kind of thing. You got to listen to the FUD is what they'd call it, you know, but FUD is just research really, you know? And is yeah, they've been talking. facts you dislike? <laughs> yeah. Well, I like that better. It's supposed to be uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Okay. I like your definition better. Yeah. It's facts you don't like. That's uh, because that's yeah, because crypto gets super cult like, you know, and they just refuse to listen to anybody, you know, exposing some of this stuff. But there's loads and loads of sketches like Tether itself is just a whole freaking rabbit hole. And that's what Bitfinex and Crypto Critics Corner were first going after them from because they got lots of money from Tether. They have really close ties with Tether, especially in the beginning, and they're getting lots of money from them. But as of right now, Tether froze all of their Tether that they had because tether can do that it's not really a crypto they can have complete control over it if you have some tether in your wallet and the government asks them to freeze it they will and that's what happened the authorities asked tether to freeze uh ftx's tether and they froze it so and wasn't tether uh one of the stable coins yeah tether is a stable coin it's the, was the first stable coin and they lied for a long time saying they were backed one-to-one with dollars but they eventually had to admit i think it was in 2018 or 17 when they uh, had a settlement with the New York state that they did not hold dollars one, one to one, and that they're actually the majority of their holdings were in commercial paper, which commercial paper is a uh, really short term unbacked loans. So like, like big companies will borrow millions of dollars for a few days to make payroll and pay them back and stuff, but they don't put up any collateral on it. So yeah. they're really short term loans. That sounds- and they were. That sounds even more fake and gay than fiat money. Yeah, yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, dude, and how what they've done, like what these exchanges are doing, the centralized authority is like le- the way they're using leverage and then, you know, borrowing on fake market caps and stuff like that. Like it's and creating like printing their own tokens and stuff like that. They're literally doing the same thing. They're printing money out of thin air and we're all falling for it and still using their platforms and using this crazy crazy high leverage they offered ftx offered 100x leverage you could put in a dollar and trade with a hundred dollars which is absolute insanity in wall street and stuff you trade like uh 3x etfs or something like that three times leverage that sounds totally normal and not at all a scheme of any sorts Oh yeah, most people who do it, most retail traders that do it just lose all their money. They get liquidated. So if you use a hundred X leverage, the price only has to move one percent against you to get liquidated and all your funds move. At 50X leverage, it's gotta do like 2.5% against you or something like that. It's yeah, it's just really incredibly risky and they're just stealing people's money. So that's that that sounds like a good point for me to ask this question is what's the legality of all this? Is what Sam did illegal. Uh, I know both of his parents were compliance officers. So I have to presume that they're gonna, he's not gonna do anything that's gonna land him in prison. I mean, besides the fact that, you know, he was like the biggest donor to Democratic um, parties, even though there's like massive conflicts of interest there and everything. But is it, is it legal? No, no. All this is 100%, not only just illegal, but so blatantly illegal without even attempting to hide it that it's shocking well and right. isn't maxine waters uh leading the investigation into this yes and she's had several meetings with him too herself i saw a video where she was blowing him a kiss oh my gosh we got to get that in a meme yeah it, <laughs> it, so this, this is what i was going to ask so i you know am 
because I don't really understand all of the ins and outs of crypto, but I am interested in the story and what is the point here? So if, if everybody knew or seeing what they were doing now, looking in and like, this is insane. Nobody would do this in a sane world. So the question that I wanted to ask Daniel is, do you think that this was okay? So Crip, uh, Cyprian had said, don't look too, too far into this. This was a Ponzi scheme. That's all that this was. But then from what I have seen about his deep state connections, his world economic forum connections, um, all of that stuff, it seems like this was all, and he's not arrested yet. They know where he's at and he, and nothing is happening to him. And he's still supposed to be speaking for the New York times. So it seems like he is just playing a part to me, like that this was all done to launder money to Ukraine and the Democrats and then to bring in crypto regulation. I mean, he even, there's even a, a an Elizabeth Warren connection and she was anti-crypto. And, and of course now she's calling for regulation, even though she benefited from this situation. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah he was it all some... sounds very fishy from, from the get go. It's yeah. like from the time it blew up and you know, everything that's happened since then, it, it just all reeks. Yeah. It's hard to believe there isn't something like that going on. I mean, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, so it's really hard to speculate, but it is just really strange where he got all of his money. First of all, to build the fourth biggest exchange and uh, like the second or third biggest trading firm in crypto in three years you know and uh also with elizabeth warren example the reason he had he wrote he like lobbied and helped pay the people that wrote the regulations that elizabeth warren is trying to pass right now still that's what these lobby firms do you know you know nobody in congress wrote obamacare you know the uh insurance agencies themselves or the people, lawyers working for the insurance agencies wrote Obamacare and Congress approved it. And it's the same thing going on in crypto. So that's why I had such a cozied up relationship with her was because she was, uh, he was helping write the regulations. He was lobbying to get the regulations he wanted passed, which is really crazy because he was breaking every law and financial law in the books himself, you know, and nobody noticed it. And there's also these crypto uh, investigation or what we call them chain. Well, there's one called chain analysis, chain analysis, you know, they analyze blockchains and stuff like that. When mm -hmm. governments need to do investigations, they go to these guys who are supposed to be experts in watching the blockchains and then researching them and uh, digging it, looking, trying to identify people in them and stuff like that. And they are supposed to be watching for this kind of stuff. And somehow none of those companies picked up the fact that Alamada Research's wallets and FTX's wallets were commingling like on a daily basis, like sending money between them. That should have been huge, you know, and these are some of the biggest people in crypto, like biggest companies in crypto that not necessarily doing like s exchanges or running a, uh, a, to a project or something like that, but working just in the industry. And the, that's what the, one of the biggest money makers in the industry is analyzing the chains. And they did not, either they looked the other way or they didn't notice this at all. And then just every politician Speaking that's on, met oh, with him. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to back up a little before you, you keep <laughs> moving forward on stuff. Um, kind of what got me interested in this is I'm watching the train wreck from um, kind of Kim.com had a, had a friend who used to, used to have a podcast. Now he's getting pretty big. Mario Nafal um, of IBC Group. Um, he's hosted a call ever since. And Kim's got on a couple of times. Um, Elon Musk has gotten on. But man, I've heard some some interesting allegations there on, on a number of things. And, and back to Ashley's question on, wasn't anybody noticing these things? Um, uh, the CEO of New Genesis hopped on the call and started talking about uh, back in March, we saw that either Liquid or Alameda had um, created 199 million synthetic new coins. And they're like, wait, what's going on here? Where'd these coins come from? And they asked him about it. The coins disappeared. And he said it took them three months to figure out what, it, what had happened. And clearly they were, they were minting, minting crypto and putting it on exchanges. Um, yeah, they're minting their own like tokens and lying about it. Hmm. Right, right. So, yeah, there's 
they put together a big documentary on it. He said that only covers 10% of the a three hour documentary. He said it only covers like 10% of the evidence, but all of it's going to come out. And there's lots of, and he said by coming on this call, he's hoping that others that may have noticed something, they had a hard time getting the regulators to even, to even pay attention to them. Um, and speaking of regulators, that was another topic that someone said, yeah, all the regulators we deal with are very young. If they have any brain, they get hired up into, into the industry and make more money than they would initially. So regulation is pretty, pretty yeah. silly. They're always going to be behind the eight ball and they're never going to understand the technology. Like the regulation trying to save, solve mm -hmm. our problems with this just isn't going to work. They don't know. Yeah. Obviously, they missed the biggest thing. They're sitting there going after library and Ripple. Like they just ruled against library as a um, as a security, which you cannot find one person out there who bought the library token who feels like they were ripped off or stolen from or something. Whereas every single customer in FTX was robbed. Every single one. He was cozying up to FTX and going as hard as they can, spending millions and millions going after library while nobody was getting stolen from from library. They didn't lie about anything and they created the product they were supposed to. And FTX just gets an art, you know, gets <laughs> gets a pat on the back. Well, and I've always, I've always been suspicious of, oh, go ahead. And many of FTX employees got screwed royally too with their yeah, benefits. Yeah, a lot of them did. Some of them them. got out though. At, when, when, uh, after they suspended withdrawals, they opened withdrawals in the Bahamas only. And they said they did that because the Bahamas authority told them, like made them do it. But it also, people are speculating that they did that. So the uh, closest employees there could get their money out while everyone else couldn't. So, yeah, they, but yeah, they screwed over a lot of people in there that worked for them. They were a big, there was over a hundred subsidiaries of FTX. Over a hundred is the craziest web of unorganized nonsense you've ever seen with no accounting. And that's wild. Yeah, I didn't realize yeah, that a while back. I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> A while oh, back, I was just going to say a while back, I saw like an FTX web that showed FTX and all their other businesses. And there was like 15 or 20 things on there. And I thought that was kind of crazy. This was months ago, though. And then now when you see the web and see how many they really had, it was like over 100. It's crazy in there. I guess some of them aren't declaring bankruptcy, just most of them are. And it was just this crazy web with no accounting. The guy who's taken over FTX, he is the lawyer that he's special specializes in like liquidations and bankruptcies and stuff he's the guy that did enron he took over enron as they went into bankruptcy and saw it through bankruptcy now he's doing ftx he said they had no accounting department and they outsourced <laughs> accounting to a third party which was also one of the subsidiaries that just didn't do anything they literally just didn't have an accounting process it sounds like a good job if Are you, you talking about it are you talking about Don Freiberg? Friedberg? No. The dude that was associated with the poker scandal? Oh, no, that's a, yeah, that's a, no, he's not, this guy is like a legitimate lawyer. He's like had to come in when they declare bankruptcy. The guy you're talking about is the, was the CTO, chief technology officer of uh, FTX, which I've known about this forever because of the guy from Bitfinex and the guys from Crypto Critics Corner, but uh, I've known that he was a, you know, scammer from Ultimate Bet. For a while, I was surprised everybody else. I thought everybody knew that in the crypto space, or at least everyone who's really into it, like I am. I thought everybody realized that because we were talking about that a year or yeah. two ago. That they created a back door. They had a poker site, and they created a back door where if you had, if you, if they allowed you to, you could see everybody's cards and win all the money. So I remember that. Yeah, and he's the uh, chief technology officer there. So the signs were there, and I've always been suspicious of them, but not assuming that they were illiquid or not doing accounting, I thought they were like establishment hacks, you know, establishment front, the way they came out supporting climate change and supporting Democrats and all that stuff and the way they came out of nowhere. And it just, and they just are so left wing about everything. They say, I mean, they don't get specifically political, but all the causes they support are all left wing causes. So that's what I always thought of them. I didn't trust them on that front. Like, I've never used anything with FTX, but that's that's why I thought I didn't expect them just to not have any of the money, which I mean, I know most of these exchanges are probably like don't have all the money. I, I would be surprised if most exchanges like KuCoin and Bit, uh, Binance and stuff, if they have as much money as they say they do. But uh, this is just absurd how 
it little seems they like, had. It seems like they're doing fractional reserve banking, but without the oh. FDIC. Yeah, they they definitely are. That's what all again. It's really ironic that this is where we're at in crypto now. You know, whereas we still can hardly get people to even buy stuff with Bitcoin, but we're all leveraged up to the tits on these centralized exchanges that don't even have our money. They take our money out. You keep seeing people, these exchanges are posting proofs of reserves lately too. Like, oh, look, we got proofs of reserves, but they're not. Reserves and customer deposits are not supposed to be the same thing. So they're supposed to be two separate things. A company's reserves is like their emergency fund for operating. You know, if they need to buy, get new server services or hire more employees because they're getting more traffic or something like that. that's what reserves are supposed to be for customer deposits are supposed to not be their money it's supposed to be their customers money that they don't touch you know they just swap it between customer accounts and take a fee when they buy when they sell uh, buy buy and sell it that's what but they're all posting proof of reserves like this is proving something but they're not showing any liabilities first of all and second of all they're not showing how much of that is customer deposits for what is their operating reserves and it's just it's getting absurd there are better exchanges like if you're going for centralized exchanges the ones that have been around a while kraken and uh i use kraken and bit or uh bitrix those two have been around for a while several bear markets and never gone down but they're both u.s regulated too so you got a kyc and everything mm. but well it's, it's, i still have most of my coin on coinbase so coinbase like they're yeah they're u.s regulated too i mean i wouldn't say they're uh completely safe to keep it all there but it's definitely safer than keep it on binance or something like that <laughs> so at least it's are they fdic and it's from what i understand oh it's if you leave dollar if you have dollars on coinbase it's fdic insured but once well, you why, convert it to crypto it's not anymore and why would you just leave dollars sitting on coinbase that doesn't make right sense. exactly well i guess some traders might for you know trading and stuff like that but that's still not going to be a huge part of their position and stuff so right um so I, I just wanted to back up a little bit and um we know that it's basically a mystery where they started to get their funds from um and you know what this reminds me of jeffrey epstein yes um, very much so so it, it, i'm sorry justin i just want to say and it reminds me of other things too right like all of a sudden you have these Ivy League either dropouts or graduates, and they just, you know, from the bottom up, create a miraculous company that changes everything. It's a lie. It's just, it just strikes me as a total bullshit. It's the same thing with like Facebook and LifeLog and all this other nonsense. Microsoft. Yeah, PayPal. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does smell. It does. But yeah, it does come off as a created person, you know? Exactly. And, uh, I just don't trust it. And I just heard someone mention earlier, you know, earlier you said, uh, Justin, that you do, can't imagine him going to jail, but all this is like blatantly illegal. It's hard to imagine him not going to jail, to be honest. Bernie Madoff well, got life in prison, and this was way more. Well, here's uh, here's the difference from my perspective. And same thing with the uh, Thanos chick. The difference Theranos. is that, yeah, Theranos, thank you. Um, but the difference to me is they're ripping off the elite. Well, the FTX guy, he's just ripping off us lowly plebs for the most at, part. At the behest of the elite, likely, is what right. it seems like to me. Who really got ripped off the most from this isn't the, well, I mean, the plebs, they lost a bunch of their own money, especially the personal, but the amount, like, uh, dollar amount wise, who lost the most out of this is the big players in crypto. They're taking them out like bowling pins right now. Mm. That's who the big losses is from. That's why it almost seems like, I've heard some people describe it as a Ponzi scheme destroyer, just to go in there. All these Ponzi schemes are going crazy in crypto and go in there. First of all, make the Ponzi schemes bigger because that's what FTX did. They invent, invested in a bunch of shit coins and Ponzi schemes and bring inflate that bubble as big as you can and then bring a wrecking ball into it and re rebuild the order almost, you know, because mm -hmm. loads of people. I don't know. Have you guys been paying attention to Grayscale? Have you heard this is the latest, you know, bowling pin going down grayscale Bitcoin trust. It I've is never the, heard of it. Same. Oh, you never heard of grayscale? Mm -mm. It's uh owned by Dollar Currency Group, which is uh the they're the people that uh, Dollar Currency Group. Oh, just Googled Dollar Currency or Digital Currency Group. I'm sorry, not Dollar, Digital Currency Group. Uh they've been around for a long time. They own three arrows capital, which went down uh a few months that they went down with the Luna crash. And they own uh, CoinDesk, the 
they own several of the biggest news crypto news uh websites gotcha. and, yeah they own all kinds of stuff but anyways they have like this they have a what's called the grayscale bitcoin trust and they don't only have it for bitcoin they have it for ethereum and solana and zcash and all kinds of them where it's basically uh derivative you it's you can buy it through a traditional broker uh, just like on uh fidelity or something like that and it's grayscale bitcoin trust is you're supposed to buy one share and it's supposed to be the same as owning one bitcoin and they're supposedly hold all the bitcoin one for one for you and it's a way to trade uh like it's the way like professionals are supposed to and these big firms who can't take the risk of using exchanges and the legalities and that kind of stuff this was supposed to be like the legitimate way to invest into bitcoin but now the since three arrow capitals collapse and dollar and the found out the dollar currency group had positions in ftx also people are questioning how much bitcoin they held and they asked for them to show their bitcoin wallet because that's their whole thing they're supposed to be this regulated legitimate uh instrument to trade bitcoin with and so they're like okay show us this wallet and they refused to show the wallet they said for security reasons they can't and a, a few weeks ago they transferred custody from genesis which genesis is the other latest uh firm to going kaput you know their genesis was similar to like ftx or not ftx similar to alamada uh market maker otc trading firm desk they're the oldest one they've been around since 2013 and now they're uh i don't think they've declared bankruptcy yet but they're going insolvent they've suspended withdrawals for they're connected with the Gemin, gemini exchange is that their name yeah gemini and uh, they have a gemini earn program where basically you put your crypto in there and they pay you 10 percent a year and they take your crypto and go invest it in stuff send it over to uh the genesis trading desk and they trade in stuff well now genesis has lost a bunch of money and they're going insolvent and they were holding grayscale bitcoin trust bitcoin up until a few weeks ago do they transfer it to custody at coinbase but they won't share how much it is so now grayscale bitcoin trust is collapsing it's selling it a 50 percent discount it's like eight eight or nine thousand dollars right now and it's supposed to be one-to-one -one with bitcoin and yeah so things are just getting knocked down like a bowling pins right now so they're really why do you why do you think that that's happening do you feel like it is the predator class uh that are pulling the strings here and that they are going after people who had an opportunity to truly operate outside of the system or um you know what what is your take on on what's happening why is this happening right now <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say anything for sure because it's hard to know. But yeah, I do have a hypothesis that this is, you know, some establishment operation to get in there and basically uh, reform the guard, take out all the big players and replace them with, you know, their people maybe or just maybe discredit the entire thing or get the crazy regulations. It is coincidental that it's coming right as they're passing these regulations and stuff like that. And Europe's been going crazy with crypto regulations, too. So it. I mean, it's hard to know exactly why, but I am suspicious that it's something like that, that because it does seem like it seems like a changing of the guard to me right now. Like they're destroying all the biggest players in crypto and maybe just to uh, disincent, uh, discredit it. You know, mm -hmm. that might just be the entire goal because lots of and people are losing faith in crypto over this right now. And at the same time, you, you, I assume you saw that the New York Federal Bank um has started a cbdc pilot yes just at the exact same time this right. is all happening they're doing the three month long yeah so, so it's, where there's smoke, yeah it's all very quick yeah there's just so much going on the sec filing uh closing case against a uh, library that was a big deal now basically 90 percent of cryptocurrencies are securities and it's illegal for anybody to buy sell or buy or sell them anywhere that's not uh uh regulated by the securities exchange committee you know that's a big deal that's a huge deal that means a lot of these cryptos are going to get delisted from u.s regulated exchanges and yeah and then oh, can, go ahead. Can, can you just what are some of the best like non-kyc decentralized exchanges you would recommend to like friends and family oh uh, to hold coins on like the whole coins just, on or just to them. buy just to buy and sell <laughs> and then move them to a private wallet as one should be doing um well for non-kyc purchases i use kucoin but 
I don't really trust them. That might just be because I already have an account there because I certainly don't trust them. And I wouldn't be surprised if they don't go, you know, falling down after this. But what I really think the answer is to this is things called, uh, do you know what at atomic swaps are? I do not. Okay. Do you know what a DEX is? A de yes. decentralized exchange. Okay. The main type of decentralized exchanges are things built on the Ethereum. I guess I was talking about this in the crypto chat yesterday. Anyways, the DEX on Ethereum mm -hmm. or a, a, something, a smart contract platform similar to Ethereum, it's supposed to be a way to trade without an exchange, without any third party uh, you know, that can interfere in it. And the way they did that was with a thing called liquidity pools. And you put Basically, a bunch of people put their money, you know, if you have a pair, Bitcoin, or Bitcoin's not really, say Ethereum and Shiba, you have a pair on there, people can deposit uh, Ethereum and Shiba to provide liquidity. And so if you want to go buy it, you can go just buy it from this big pool. They put all this uh, liquidity pool that they put everybody's money in. You can buy it and sell it from there. And if you're providing liquidity from the, on there like that, you get rewarded in some of the fees that come from uh, those trades. And it works great during a bull market. People go provide liquidity and basically it's called yield farming is what they call it. And they get a high interest rate paid in whatever coins they provided liquidity for. And yeah, it works great in a bull market, but in a bear market, you just lose your money putting it in there. And there's lots of other problems. Like it's got to be a, on a, a Ethereum DEX, it's got to be an Ethereum token to be traded on there. So that's why you can't trade Bitcoin on there. You have to use a wrapped version of it, like I was explaining the other day. But anyways, with atomic swaps, I find them a very or a way superior way to build a DEX. It's basically you just swap from one from your private wallet if you're selling to another person's private wallet who's buying. Okay, so it's kind of like, kind of like a like a, almost an eBay type or like so you have this, I want that. So you just do a trade like it's it's just a yeah. middleman that kind of puts you two together. Yeah, but uh, eBay is not even really there. You know, it's just kind of a protocol right. that can go. It's uh, if you're trying to swap between Bitcoin and Litecoin, the Bitcoin goes, uh, the Bitcoin just basically goes to your wallet while the Litecoin goes to his wallet. You have to provide two wallets, you have to have two wallets for it. you have to have a Litecoin and a Bitcoin. If you're selling your Bitcoin, you just uh, have it going in your out of your wallet, and you have Litecoin going into your Litecoin wallet, and it's just peer to peer like that, no KYC required or anything like that. And nobody can stop it, and you have control of the money. It's never in a third party. You get uh, a seed phrase just like you do with Bitcoin, and you can restore your wallet all at once. Atomic Dex is my favorite Atomic Swap Dex, and you it has you know dozens, maybe even hundreds of pairs on there, so you can deposit Ethereum or Doge or Bitcoin or Pirate Chain on there and you can safely store it on there because it you know you're just responsible for your own seed phrase there's nothing to be hacked there's no liquidity pool to be hacked there's no liquidity pool to provide liquidity you're just buying it from one person to another it's basically the same thing as if you were just met someone in a parking lot and gave him some litecoin for some bitcoin you know it's that same thing except you guys don't have to know each other or be in the same space to do it and i think that's a way superior way to buy and sell but there are issues with well not issues there's a issue with it that they don't get used that much so liquidity is really low and chances are if you go to try some bitcoin buy some bitcoin there you're going to pay two percent or three percent higher than if you bought it on coinbase or somewhere else well so and that's that was my the major selling point for coinbase for me because i'm retarded and it's just so easy to you know i just link my bank account put the app on my phone uh oh two hundred dollars in bitcoin boom it's you know i have it i mean it you know it looks yeah. like i have it at least yeah, and that's not, it's not a bad thing for beginners to do that kind of stuff. I would say you should probably go through the steps of learning how to self custody and send it to a wallet. It's not as, especially if you're just dealing with Bitcoin, if you're still dealing with like Ethereum tokens and all this other DeFi stuff. It's more, more complex, but Bitcoin's not that complex. And you can just, you could literally safely store it by downloading a wallet to your phone, sending the Bitcoin to it securing the seed phrase somewhere writing it down multiple places or whatever you do whatever your protocol is for saving that then delete the wallet off your phone you don't need the wallet on there all the time and whenever you need to access the money you re-download a wallet enter the seed phrase and your funds are there so it's a lot it's not as hard to self-custody as some people assume but i understand if you got significant money in it why you'd be nervous to do it and stuff like that but i don't think going through centralized exchanges is that detrimental you know bitcoin's supposed to be money it's companies are going to use Bitcoin if it ever gets to what we want it to be, you know? We're not just going to ignore companies because they're centralized. We'll only buy stuff through decentralized 
marketplaces or something. You know, well, if Walmart accepts Bitcoin, it would be a success, you know? So we're not again. So just do the research on the exchange and go with one that's been around for a long time. Kraken's been around since like 2013 or something. Multiple bear markets never had any problems. Uh, Bittrex has been the same way. And to be honest, Coinbase has kind of been the same way too. They, they, or they haven't been around as long, but they don't have any problems. So, and also they're US regulated. So if they ever do go down, you might see some of your money in the future. You know, some of these people on FTX probably won't ever see any of their money. Oh, ever, so. And then back to, you know, because we, I, I, I realized that branch just off from FTX for a minute there. Um, but I did see right when all this was happening, was it FTX that was claiming that they were being hacked or was that more third parties that saying that they were getting hacked? Uh, it was third parties that noticed it at first. It was not FTX that came out and said it. And it was most, almost certainly someone who works who had a, like developer access to it. It's like almost certainly was. And there was several things happening at once. There was a black hat hacker who was taking out as much money as he could. And then a white hat hacker, someone with good intentions that was just taking funds out to a secure wallet. We still don't know who that was either. The only reason we know they weren't trying to liquidate it is because they just sent it to a wallet and it's set there since then. And then at the same time, the Bahamas authorities made them send a bunch of assets to them for safekeeping during the bankruptcy, which isn't supposed to be how it works. Now the U.S. bankruptcy and the Bahamas bankruptcy are going to be going at each other's throats over that stuff, but the Bahamas government has it now. So yeah, there was this black hat. Who's that black hat? He dumped a bunch of it on DeFi platforms and lost a bunch of money to slippage. Basically, he sold it as quick as he could and got it into Ethereum as quick as he could he didn't care that he was losing a bunch of money because of it. you'll notice and he started again today last night he was started dumping it again and you'll notice ethereum's down a couple percent this morning and that's basically because this guy is dumping as much as he can on every DeFi platform there is out there yeah. so uh, he did first was doing it on kraken and kraken froze his account so and kraken might have identified who the person is too so but they haven't announced that or anything yet but they're working well, with authorities given the state of the world i have to assume that he worked for putin <laughs> <laughs> right exactly it was putin's fault it's all always putin's fault oh, yeah. we all there's just that. there's just so much like it's it's and i'm sure we wanted to get this this episode out while it's still somewhat relevant but i have a feeling that we're going to keep hearing about this is going to be a story that's going to keep popping up for for quite some time uh and that's yeah, this... not even just for the bankruptcy proceedings that are going to happen no, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Right before I got on here, I found this great Medium post that I haven't even got through to read, which is all about the Free Arrows Capital, Dollar Currency Group, and uh, FTX, and links through to the um, to Ukraine and Ukraine uh, the Ukraine Ukrainian donation scheme. You know, and basically, from what they uh, claim. Laundry. They got like $60 million in donations in just a few weeks, but the donations have been up since then and they have not increased the amount they've claimed to they've got. So basically they got $60 million in a couple of weeks, but in the last six months, they haven't got any money to these donation wallets and addresses that they still have up and are still advertising. So there's some questions there too, where all that money went. That sounds so, an awful lot like the Clinton Foundation. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. They learned, they learned from the best, you know, but it's. <laughs> It's also it's all really overwhelming. There's so much to the story and so many spider webs that go everywhere and so much to hypothesize about. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get some answers someday. But it is really, really, really suspicious. This guy wasn't supporting Republicans. But to be honest, if you're trying to be a free market, free money, uh, you know, free backed mo like sound money guy. You, you're gonna go with the democrats to fund yes. if you're trying to get sound money like that yeah it's like, yeah, so you, at that point you'd be going to like rand and ron paul justin amash thomas massey like i mean they aren't perfect yeah. by any means but in the world of politics those are really your only options if that's what your actual intentions are yeah so it's all really but overwhelming I did, hear, I did hear that they had some a number of republican recipients as well and one of them oh, yeah. offered to return the funds yeah they they did have some republican ones but it was you know he was, yeah, was joe good. biden's big second biggest donor and stuff you know it was so, low level right. my understanding for the republican donations i mean of course my opinion is that they're they're both just two wings on the same predatory bird but it was significantly less 
contributions to the Republicans. Um, but I still think like you know, are all on the same team. Yeah. Yeah, There's, they're the same team. Yeah, do you make do you make anything of the did you hear uh, subpoenas went out on Friday from uh some financial industry regulation authority uh to a number of crypto infl- influencers? Um Richard Hart is one of them from Hex. He's the one oh, that I did not see on, that. Um, on the call a couple of times and people love to hate him because he's an ass. Uh, he's real yeah. rude, but he's mostly, mostly right. Uh, but he really he has been, really he was harsh. one of the early guys calling out FTX. I think what you will of him, but he was one of the guys calling out FTX a couple years ago. So. Right. But he and a bunch of others have, have been accused of pump and dump scheme, schemes. Mm. They'll, they'll create hype or FUDs over, over something and make money off the, off the deal and some have been paid for it too youtube influencers have been paid to, to hype stuff so uh, oh be, yeah they know, definitely have be there's been there's been uh price sheets leaked from uh uh these management companies that manage a bunch of these crypto influencers bitboy and all these other guys you see on youtube they've price sheets have leaked on how much it costs for you to you know to show one of your projects you know they'll mention it for five thousand dollars or do a whole show on it for twenty five thousand dollars or something like that well hold on how do we get in on this shield business because we have a podcast granted we don't have a million subscribers well, I think for like five five hundred to thousand bucks we 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 dedicate an entire episode to how great they are <laughs> yeah well uh, oh crap can you hear me still yes yeah. sir okay i'm having a problem i think my zoom might be freezing up zoom does not work on linux very well mm-hmm. so hopefully it pulls through this but if it doesn't i'll just reconnect real quick okay. so, yeah i don't know how you get on that that's what i was wondering too because <laughs> yeah the, there's uh i can't remember their names i could figure it out for you but yeah there's several marketing groups that run all the major crypto influencers like all of them even down to small ones and only got like twenty thousand followers and they'll shill for money you know but i'm starting to think those days are going to be over soon because these subpoenas i've been expecting those things for a while i'm surprised richard hart's the first one to get them i thought you'd think like bitboy or somebody would be but uh i'm uh i think there's a bunch. certain more of that stuff's going to go out and people are going to be prosecuted for all kinds of sketchy stuff in crypto over the next five ten years so there, these pump and dumps have gotten oh, ridiculous man. And it all started with what was it the Bitcoin Five up in New Hampshire? Oh yeah, they those running poor the guys. Bitcoin ATMs. Yep, they're going after those guys. They're not hurting anybody, and while uh, these scams run absolutely rampant. Yep, and didn't didn't what at least one of them just get some massive jail time over the last year? I know I forgot to uh, catch up on that. Uh, I was I was watching it when they're going to trial, but I haven't I haven't seen what the conclusion was. I hope not. Those guys are aren't they part of the Free State Project and all that? Yes, isn't sir. that like the place where the headquarters was at? Like the Free State Project was out of? I believe. Yeah, they so. were doing the Free State Live there and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and that's why we can't have any Liberty Heroes because they're either going to get Waco, JFK, a uh, Bitcoin Five. Yes, I definitely see a lot of trouble for people trying to like hold on to the original ethos of Bitcoin, of sound money, you know, without government interference, you can self custody yourself and actually use it to buy stuff. And uh, I think there's going to be a and the privacy coin, (laughs) privacy coin guys like me, Pirate Chain and Monero and stuff, they're going to be in the crosshairs in the future and we're going to have a fight ahead of us. Cool. But the thing is about the the about Bitcoin, Monero, Pirate Chain is they can't be shut down by regulations. They can be stifled, you know, but they can make it illegal. But they made drugs illegal too. But they can't they can't stop it completely, you know. And we got to fight for and at least for the things I believe in for finding privacy in this crazy, uh, you know, world where we're watched at every moment of the day. I think there's going to be a fight for those of us but i think a lot of us are ready for it we're going to keep using and building things like monero and pirate chain to have I that hope escape there's a fight. if there's not a fight we're all we're all fucked yeah and Excuse if there's not a French. fight it's like why wasn't there a fight there's supposed to be a fight <laughs> this is supposed to totally upset the establishment so if it's not totally upsetting the establishment what the hell are we doing um so, uh, so we're starting yeah. to come up close to an hour. I don't want to take a ton of your time. Does, um, oh, I have does, as much time as you need. Okay. Care. I'd say, is, is there anything else that 
you know, is that we missed on the FTX that we really, you know, everyone should know about? Yeah, that's a great question. Like, what I, are you looking for now, Daniel, like going forward? Well, I don't think it's going to look great for the price of, I mean, this isn't financial advice, obviously, <laughs> but I don't think it's going to look pro- great for the price going forward. And there these this web goes so deep into every angle of crypto i mean dollar currency group is going now if you google di- dollar currency group, dollar i keep saying dollar it's digital currency group digital currency group you will see how far these webs go of these people and i've never been super big fans of these kind types of entities three arrows capital alameda all these big crypto firms but a lot of these people came to their money by being into bitcoin early and making a bunch of money from it and starting firms and they're going down like bowling pins now. A lot of it's their own fault because of incompetence, but it does almost seem like it's being done on purpose with people like CZ and stuff. But just some of the people that, uh, you know, Dollar Currency Group owns or is invested in is people like BitGo. BitGo is the biggest crypto custodian. People, if you own billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, it's not really safe for you to store it yourself. You give it to professionals to store it. BitGo is the biggest one. They're owned by Dollar Currency Group um the they're the ones that started the brave browser their uh own circle which issues usdc the second biggest stable coin they own coindesk and several of the other biggest uh news firms and they're basically invested in every major exchange and it looks like they're going they're having troubles right now and grayscale bitcoin trust which is supposed to be the regulated safe vehicle to invest in bitcoin with and it's until they prove that they have their it's really suspicious they won't show their reserves and until they prove that people are going they might go down until they prove that and but who knows if they really have it and if they don't that'll be such a huge red flag for the u.s regulators if grayscale bitcoin trust didn't have all the bitcoin they had were supposed to this whole time it's it's really insanity so i think we're going to see a lot i think this is just beginning we're going to see a lot more bowling pins go down i you know self-custody your crypto and you know if anyone needs help with that you can message me i'll even help you with ethereum and metamask kind of stuff if you need it get them off these exchanges and definitely get them off you know these offshore exchanges we don't know what's happening with them it's this is just beginning is what real I'm quick well, well you mentioned stable coin i noticed um christine gillibrand and a couple of other senators have a bill they're going to propose soon about stable coin can you help me understand as a new person uh is that a good thing bad thing what's stable coin versus Versus everything um, else. A stable coin, it's basically, it's, it's supposed to be an instrument that a, a crypto instrument is pegged to a dollar. It's supposed to always be worth a dollar, but it's supposed to always be worth a dollar because there's a company behind it that does it. Tether is the biggest one. And basically you give a bunch of money to Tether, you give a hundred million dollars to Tether, Tether and they give you a hundred million dollars in USDT, their uh, tether currency and then they take your hundred million dollars in real dollars that you gave them and they invest them in commercial paper and securities and other things they never really they've never been audited but that's what they say they do with it who knows what they really do with it and those stable coins are not really a real crypto they're on blockchains like usdt is a token on the ethereum blockchain but the way they wrote the smart contract they control everything about it so if you hold some usdt some tether they can freeze it in your wallet or they could just make it go away instantly. They do it whenever uh, the regulators ask them to. And uh, they've also played part in huge manipulation, especially Tether, like printing money they don't have. You know, they could, the all the exchanges accept yeah. Tether as, in, as a trading pair. And so they just print a bunch of Tether out of thin air, send it to exchanges, use that to pump up the price of Bitcoin like crazy. And they've been caught doing it several times. They've been caught not having the reserves. They've never been audited. They say they've been audited, but they've only done attestations, which an attestation is basically me paying a friend, showing my friend a bank account statement and my friend saying, yeah, he's got all the money. So that's, so it's like when the cops investigate themselves after they murder someone. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great example. <laughs> exactly like that. There's no proof of where the money came from or they can just throw a bunch of money in a bank account one day and then uh, remove it the next day. And so, yeah, they, so they have the craziest, sketchiest stuff that's going on with it. And there's parts of the world that are like using Tether now to buy stuff. It's almost like Tether's almost as used for purchases as much as Bitcoin is. Um, so what is, hypothetically, what is the advantage to having a stable coin? 
uh, because it just seems something that's silly and unnecessary to me as someone that's not big into like crypto world and everything like that. Because an unregulated exchange, offshore exchange, can't accept dollars. They can't, uh, what's the, the SWIFT system? They can't participate in the SWIFT system without being regulated. But you make a token that's on the Ethereum blockchain that can't, then that you can exchange for dollars, then you can trade out, you send this to the offshore exchange to trade okay. with. Yeah, and people, it's easier to trade for people who are actually active traders, not just investors. It's far easier to trade with something denominated in dollars than with two two different cryptos or something like that that are so volatile. Just doing that math gets confusing. It's a lot easier for everybody for things denominated in dollars. So they're super convenient, but, you know. As <laughs> with all things as convenient. Yeah, so that's the big thing they offer is, and also they can use it to manipulate prices like crazy, but right yeah. but yeah for the average user it's just things like a uh, kucoin or ftx the offshore ftx uh exchange stuff like that they wouldn't be able to accept dollars because they're not regulated and sometimes they can find someone to do process dollar payments for a little while but then they get shut down and stuff like that there's a lot of that in the early days of crypto trying to find dollar processing stuff like that because they yeah it just makes it hard that's why you can just use dollars on you can use your credit card on coinbase or uh, Kraken or uh, any of those exchanges, regulated exchanges, but you can't use it on uh, an offshore one like KuCoin or something. So okay, that makes sense. Especially if you're if we're more privacy oriented, then you know you don't have you know you don't want your bank account linked to the Monero you're buying because that's yeah, just, duh. Yeah, exactly, and it's just a. Uh, you can't really buy crypto without KYC with U.S. dollars. Or I guess you can if you do it in person, like if you do localbitcoins.com right. or something. So there's not very, back in the day, because the first time I bought Bitcoin, I met someone in a Walmart parking lot and bought it. <laughs> yeah, and I bought it with, with cash. I just gave him cash and he so, and I couldn't figure out how to use my wallet for a little while. And he was like showing me how to do it. And stuff. But yeah, that was the first time I bought Bitcoin. And that's where I bought, that's how I bought most of my crypto, actually. Well, most of my Bitcoin, most of the other crypto I bought with crypto, Bitcoin profits, and that's where I got the Bitcoin initially was those person-to-person -person, uh, sales. And there's also local Monero where you can do the same thing with Monero, but it is more inconvenient, you know, and it's hard to find people that meet with you person-to-person. -person. Most of them want to do bank account deposits now, which that's still not hard. They'll just have a bank, uh, they'll be like a Wells Fargo customer or something, and you just go bring like a cashier's check or cash or something, go deposit in their bank account, and then they send you Bitcoin. But then you have to trust they'll send you the Bitcoin. But they have, right. like, user ratings like eBay does, you know? So, yeah, see, that sounds a whole lot like Silk Road style. Yeah, that's how I... That's actually why I bought... First time I bought Bitcoin was to order stuff off Silk Road. I didn't keep that first Bitcoin I bought. I was, a. Uh, Yeah, that was how I first... I mean, I was introduced to it by some... I don't know, someone in the libertarian sphere, you know? some show i watched or something the first time i actually went out and bought it was to order shit off silk road back in the day because so i was a bad boy i yeah but i got three years sober now so congratulations, congratulations. yeah it's uh going pretty good actually but that was my introduction into bitcoin so yeah that's the way to do it though and i want to see in the future more people meeting in person just having real gatherings you know where people can exchange bitcoin at the same time it doesn't have to be a bitcoin themed event you know i just want to see more people meet in person person or just have your local bar where everyone knows you go to that local bar there's someone buying or selling bitcoin there mm -hmm. you know just like a drug and we can just buy it in cash from each other or gold or something that'd be ideal but i don't know i have lots of opinions on bitcoin and the direction it's gone and stuff that's not really relevant to this episode well that will say that's one thing i love about a lot of the crypto guys is that you guys are always willing to, you know, show up and, you know, try and show someone, you know, how to do something. Because it can be very convoluted to someone that isn't in the know. So I say yeah. we do appreciate your time and, you know, kind of coming on here and trying to help us understand this whole fiasco. <laughs> Yeah, I hope I did a good job. I really haven't been on, you know, any shows like this. I've only done this a few times, so I'm trying to get better at being concise and on topic and that kind of stuff. So I hope I did okay. I oh, thought no, you're good. And I, um, as we had talked about earlier, hopefully you can start joining us a little bit more and, you know, continuing to bring 
your knowledge of the crypto space, not just specifically like the FTX. And I feel like we're going to need it going forward. As you said, you feel like this is just the tip of the iceberg. I do too, not because I understand crypto, but just because this is a very tangled web. Of- it really is. And I would love to come on more. I had a lot of fun, so I wouldn't mind awesome. doing it again. So uh, I'll follow the Discord and stuff, and I'll go check out your old episodes. I didn't realize you guys were doing this. I wasn't sure if we are just coming on to hang out or if we are doing some show or something, but I really liked it. So, Well, again, say we got um, uh, two shows that we do. The Saturday is just a regular you know, topic, and then every – no, I'm sorry. Monday is the regular topic, and then we do a once a week you – know, we all bring a quick news story and kind of you know, just laugh at clown world. Uh, from the safety of our own homes away from <laughs> Hillary Clinton. Um, well, I love it. I'd love to be back on. I'll be. Yeah, it's a, awesome. Thank you. We, we absolutely appreciate you taking the time out with us. Um, do really you, quick. Oh, Justin, I was just going to ask uh, Stu if he had any other follow-up questions or anything like that. No, no, that was, that was it. I appreciate yeah. it. Okay, cool. Thanks for popping on, Daniel. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Well, do you have anything you want to plug, advertise, social media, anything like that, uh, Daniel? Well, I'm actually, I started a sub stack, but I haven't finished my first piece for it in a Medium account, but I haven't finished my first piece on it. So maybe the next time I'm on, I'll link that. But you can follow me on Twitter. I'm, my uh, handle is anarchy.gov, but the dot is spelled out D-O-T, anarchy.gov. So yeah, I probably should change that. Think of something more clever too. I don't know, but yeah, you can follow me there. And maybe next time I'm on, I'll have my Substack and Medium. I can link because I'm working on a piece right now, and I'm gonna try to do one a week going That'd forward. So that would yeah. be great. That's awesome. Uh, well, I guess that we're we're pretty much at time. Um, Ashley, uh, where can everyone find us? I'm glad that you asked. So. The main place that you can find us is unionoftheunknowns.com. That has all of our contact information there. Um, But just quickly, while I have you, some specifics, you can email us at unionoftheunknowns at gmail.com. You can leave a voicemail for us, which would be, you can leave questions, comments, concerns, um, and hate mail for Justin at 404 482 3130. Again, that is 404-482-3130. We still don't have any hate mail for Justin, so we're working on that. And then you can find us on Twitter at Union Unknowns. Back to you, Justin. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate everyone hanging out with us today, especially uh, Daniel. Thanks for coming on. We hope to have you back here soon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call you the official crypto guy of the Union of the Unknowns. Uh, I love it. Thank you very much. And everyone, you know, have a great night. uh, And we'll talk to you here before too long. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Union of the Unknowns. You can find new episodes every week on all your favorite podcasting networks. 